Hi, and welcome to the Haverhill Journal, where we give you a quick look at what's going on in our city. I'm Lindsay Paris, and we here at HC Media are very excited to be here filming this episode, which marks the one-year anniversary of the journal. In honor of the occasion, we have produced a special program today dedicated to our city's most famous heroine, Hannah Dustin who 318 years ago this week returned home to Haverhill after being taken hostage by a group of Abenakis. The story of Hannah has been immortalized in the history books, but it's also ignited a firestorm of controversy over the years. Today, we're going to take a look at a collection of 200 plus year old Dustin artifacts that have been preserved and visit a few of the local monuments erected in her honor. But first, we need to answer one question. Who was Hannah Dustin? Haverhill in the 1600s was a small, remote frontier village on the boundary of the English settlement, and as such, saw frequent warfare between the Native Americans and the European settlers. Hannah Emerson Dustin, born here in 1657, had grown up with the struggle of living on the edge of the hostile wilderness. At the time of the attacks, Hannah's family was prospering. Her husband Thomas was a former constable and in March 1697 was in the process of building one of several garrison houses intended to protect Haverhill's villagers. The Abenakis, aware of the garrison construction, knew their window of opportunity was short. March 15, 1697, they struck. That day became known as the Raid on Haverhill where 27 colonists were killed and 13 taken captive, including Hannah, Mary Neff, and the infant Martha. The Dustins and their nine children were living around this spot by the present-day Haverhill High School. It was early morning, and Thomas Dustin was out working the fields when he saw the Indians approaching. He quickly gathered his older children and ran for the Marsh Garrison, one mile away. The recuperating Hannah, her nurse Mrs. Neff, and the baby were in the house. Swiftly, the Abenakis approached, wrestling them from the home and marching all of the captives north. Within hours, baby Martha had been taken from her nurse and bashed against a tree to silence her crying. The captives continued their journey, marching 12 to 14 miles a day until they reached a resting point, an island at the junction of the Merrimack and Contoocook Rivers in present-day Concord, New Hampshire. According to legend, in the early morning hours of March 30th, 1697, Hannah, Mary Neff, and Samuel Leonardson took the initiative and made their daring escape. The three were being guarded by a family of 12 sleeping Abenakis that night. Within minutes, 10 of them lay dead, with only one squaw and a young boy being spared. Hannah, Mary, and Samuel hastily retreated from the island, but returned to collect the 10 scalps wrapped in a cloth from Hannah's loom. They traveled swiftly and carefully back down the river, watchful at all times, as being recaptured would mean certain death. Traveling by night, they stopped at the home of John Lovewell in Nashua, before finally landing at Bradley Brook in West Haverhill. After her return to Haverhill, Hannah's extraordinary tale brought her renown across the Puritan colonies. She traveled to Boston with her scalps and received a bounty of 25 pounds. While in Boston, Hannah told her story to author Cotton Mather, who published the first written account of it. The story was told and retold over the ensuing centuries, but with changing social and ethical mores, it came to be viewed in a different light. Hannah's heroic status has been questioned by many, who find it offensive, if not heinous, that she is celebrated for scalping ten Abenakis, seven of them children. Whether you see her as a heroine or villainess, the debate only reinforces her status as one of New England's most famous colonial women. Although Hannah's story continues to generate controversy, there is no question that hers is an exceptionally compelling legend of the early American frontier. Befitting her status as a Haverhill historical icon, the Buttonwoods Museum contains an extensive collection of Dustin memorabilia, including what may be the very weapon Hannah used to make her midnight escape. Kaylee Paré presented us with a few of these heirloom pieces to give us a tangible reminder of life as a 17th century villager. 
Hi, I'm Kaylee Pere of the Buttonwoods Museum, and we're going to explore some of the artifacts that we have associated with Hannah Dustin here at the Buttonwoods Museum. The first one we have is a hatchet head. This is the hatchet that we believe might have belonged to Hannah Dustin. It came to the museum through Dustin descendants, and it came from the Haverhill area. We've had it tested both on the shape of the hatchet as well as the chemical composition. And we believe that it's dated from the late 17th century, so it could be something that Hannah used at home on a daily basis, may have been something that she used during her captivity. We can't say for certain, but that's about as close as we can get. It's the right time period, it's the right area, it's the right family. This is Hannah Dustin's Confession of Faith. It was the document that she needed to enter the church. She didn't enter her formal church until a few years before her death. Based on what we have in Hannah's document, as well as her husband's Confession of Faith, we know that they're in the same handwriting. So Hannah most likely did not know how to write. They were either both written by her husband, Thomas Dustin, or somebody wrote it for both of them. Being sensible, it is my duty. I desire the church to receive me, though it be at the 11th hour, and pray for me that I may honor God and obtain the salvation of my soul. Hannah Dustin, wife of Thomas. The museum owns quite a few scalp cloths. These are uh, two examples. One is a swatch that I have here in one hand, and the other is pictured in this image um, from a Dustin descendant displaying her scalp cloth. Which one is true? It's hard to say. The museum has about a dozen come from different, different sides of the Dustin family tree. They might all be pieces from the same cloth. They might not actually be the scalp cloth. One of them might be. It's hard to say. But we have quite a few and a few of them are on display here at the museum. We are looking at modern depictions of Hannah because she has captured our imaginations for so long. Uh, the first one here is a limited edition Jim Beam bourbon bottle shaped like Hannah. Uh, it's based off the statue from New Hampshire. Um, so you can see the difference in her dress where she's kind of got bare shoulders and she's holding a couple bloody scalps in her hand over here. It is still sealed. So there is still bourbon inside of this bottle. And the other one that I have is a bobblehead of Hannah. It's based off the statue here in Haverhill, so you can see her dress is a little bit different. And she bobbles. In the 19th century, around the same time as the Haverhill Historical Society began to amass that extensive collection of dust and memorabilia, the preservation of local history was growing as a popular cause. In 1855, it was decided that the time had come to build a monument to Hannah, the first of many Dustin memorials to come. Ever wonder how Monument Street got its name? Answer, this site was the home of the very first Hannah Dustin monument. The Dustin Monument Association spent six years raising funds to build a grand Italian marble obelisk right here in 1861. Unfortunately, the obelisk only stood for four years before being repossessed for non-payment. It was then sold to the city of Barrie to be used as a Civil War memorial, where it still stands today. Haverhill Gazette, September 8, 1865. Better never have thought of erecting a monument than to have the town thus disgraced by its removal. And the only way in which this stain can be blotted out is to commence anew and erect a monument that we shall not be ashamed of and place it somewhere easily accessible. Thankfully, 14 years later, E.J.M. Hale, one of the city's richest men, came to the rescue with this magnificent statue of Hannah Dustin, installed here in G.A.R. Park on Main Street on November 25, 1879. The tool in Hannah's hand isn't your typical hatchet. It's what was known as a biscayne, a common item of the time. If you look closely at the base of the monument, you can see the four panels depicting Hannah's kidnapping, her family and her captors, and finally, her escape. The Second Church of Haverhill once stood on this spot, of which Hannah became a member later in life. 
Out of Hannah's landing spot at Bradley Brook came this massive boulder weighing over 30 tons. In 1907, a team of 30 horses hauled it up here to the Monument Street location where that very first benighted monument once stood. This was also the home of Hannah's son, Jonathan, where she passed away in 1736 at the age of 79. So where's the oldest surviving monument to Hannah? You may be surprised to learn it's not here in Haverhill, but on an island in the middle of the Merrimack River, just outside Concord, New Hampshire. Hannah's story became so well known that in 1874, a statue was erected here on the island where she was brought after her capture. Little known fact, this is the very first publicly funded statue of a woman in the United States. With its potent combination of bloodshed, controversy, and historical value, the Hannah Dustin story will continue to fascinate for generations. We hope you enjoyed this special look at the legendary woman and her legacy. And as for the journal, we'll be back to our usual format on May 7th. I'm Lindsay Paris, and we'll see you then.